right, so y'all will get a little bit of a break tonight from what Dr. Hankins has been doing on the, on the stuff with the culture. Um, in this study of James is what the guys have been doing on Wednesday nights upstairs. We're kind of jumping in kind of where we're at. Um, we were actually a little bit further ahead than, than where we're going to start tonight, but I want to kind of go back and, and be able to get you guys kind of up to speed where we're at, and then we'll kind of hit the main portion uh, of what I want to hit tonight. So the book of James. James is, um, as I tell the guys, James is a hard book. It's a hard book to, to, to study. Um, it's a hard book to, to really apply to our lives. James is kind of like a, 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 the book of Proverbs in the Old Testament. The way that James writes kind of looks and mirrors a lot the way things were written in Proverbs. And if you go back and look at Proverbs, Proverbs was a lot of things to live by, to go by. And this is what James is really doing, this kind of same concept in his book. Um, a lot about the main concept, which we'll talk about in a little bit, is this idea of someone that has true faith, that someone that is truly in Christ will be obedient to God's word and the call that has been placed on their life. And that's really, again, what James is hammering on. Um, from start to finish, James is just kind of dropping the hammer the entire time. It's just really quick, hard blows that, that James kind of throws out. And something neat is as you kind of walk through James, you see a lot of similarities between the way James writes and the way Jesus talked about things in the Sermon on the Mount. There's a lot of parallels uh, in, in both of those accounts in Scripture. So let's look at this. We'll be looking at, uh, as you see, verses 19 through 25 of James chapter 1. So James says, Know this, my beloved brothers, let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger. For the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Therefore, put away all filthiness and rampant wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your souls. But, this is probably the key verse of the entire book of James, but be doers of the word and not hearers only deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man who looks intently at his natural face in a mirror. For he looks at himself and goes away and at once forgets what he was like. But the one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and perseveres, being no hearer who forgets, but a doer who acts, he will be blessed in his doing. So main idea is followers of Christ should receive God's word humbly, remember it constantly, and obey it wholeheartedly. And these are the three concepts that we're going to kind of look at tonight. Um, we'll probably be a little bit quicker through the first two. Maybe, maybe not. Uh, we, we, we may not get through the entire thing. So my guys that are sitting in here that's normally here on Wednesday night, y'all are getting a little bit of repeat. So... Evidently, the Lord put this together because y'all needed a little bit more of, of James chapter 1. So, the followers of Christ should receive God's word humbly, remember it constantly, and obey it wholeheartedly. So, some things in Scripture are prescriptive. Scripture prescribes how we should live. Scripture is giving us commands that by the grace of God, we should and must obey for the good of our lives and for the glory of God. Scripture prescribes. That's the thing about God's Word, the beauty of God's Word that I think a lot of times that, that we miss out on is the fact that God is giving us this book to live by. And everything that we could want in life and want to understand in life, if we want to know how to have a good marriage, if we want to know how to raise our kids, if we want to know how to be a follower of Christ, if we want to know how to to work things out in church life. Everything that we need to know about life is written in this book. And so that's the idea. James is like we've got to approach this, but we've got to approach God's Word with a heart of obedience. Y'all hear me? A heart of obedience. 
When we encounter the gospel of Jesus Christ, the gospel creates obedience in us. And it is that spirit that God puts in us at the time of salvation. And we'll talk about that a little bit in a, in a, more, in a few minutes as we go. And so the grace of God, one of the most essential graces we experience after receiving saving grace is the presence of the Holy Spirit. And you possibly heard me say this before, we just don't talk about the Spirit enough in church. We do not talk about the Holy Spirit enough in church. And, and the reality is, is the Holy Spirit is the one that, that Jesus said before he left. He said, there's one coming after me that would do even greater things than I have done. And he was prophesying and talking about the coming of the Holy Spirit. And it is the one that that part of the Trinity that comes into our life when we accept Christ as Lord and Savior, when we believe in him as Lord and Savior. And so you would think about that the part of the triune God, the third part of that Trinity that is in us and dwelling in us, that we would talk about the Spirit a whole lot more. And we want to understand the Spirit a whole lot more and understand what the Spirit does in our lives. And it's amazing when you start unpacking Scripture that you see everything the Spirit does in the life of a believer. He leads us, He guides us, He convicts us. And He, he guides us into situations, He opens doors. There's so many different things that the Spirit does in our life. And Paul Tripp wrote, grace is not a thing but a person, the Holy Spirit. Grace is not a theoretical concept or a one-time transaction but a living, active, and constant presence. A living and active and constant presence in our lives. We experience grace through sanctification by the Spirit and belief in the truth. Grace is the helper who guides, prompts, and sanctifies us. And it sounds like that still, small voice reminding us of the truth when we forget. And it's beautiful to think about the idea of, of the Spirit and one of the works and, and that he does in our lives is when we, when we tend to forget, remember Old Testament, the children of Israel, how often they forgot God? But as we New Testament believers have the Spirit in us, he reminds us, don't forget about your Lord. Don't forget about your Savior. Don't forget about what he has done. Don't forget about what he has called you to do. Don't forget about what he has called you to be. And, and sometimes I think we forget about the Spirit. And sometimes we definitely don't talk enough about it. And then that David Platt statement, I'll save that for, well, I may not. So David Platt, th this statement that he makes, um, he had just, if, if any of you know who David Platt is, he had been pushed out of New Orleans when Hurricane Katrina hit. Um, and him and his family went to Birmingham. That's, that's where they went to get out of out of the storm and out of the mess. And his life in, the, his family's life, him and his wife in New Orleans, they were living inner city, they were the inner city of New Orleans, they were serving. Um, they were definitely doing the things that they knew that God had called them to do for their lives while they were in New Orleans. But here comes Katrina, Katrina pushes them out, they go to Birmingham, they're in Birmingham for a short period of time. Platt gets called, David gets called to, to, to come preach at the church at Brook Hills. Um, and then it wasn't long after that that the church called him as their pastor. But what David said was that when we got to Birmingham, we moved from where God had us to this place that we were pretty sure that God wanted us. It didn't take us long to kind of fall into the things of the world is really what he was talking about. He said we bought the big house and he said, you know, when you buy the big house, you got to fill the big house with stuff. And so he said, before we know it, we're just kind of kind of fitting in culturally with everything that's going on around us. And, and this was his statement that he said about that. He said, unfortunately, I ignored the word of God. I put God off. Yet by his grace, he walked with me in my disobedience until finally his word broke through my hard heart. And I realized we need to make some changes. And you think about that, and you think about, again, that kind of goes back to the Holy Spirit's work in our life, but how the Word works in our life. And how the more we're in the Word, and the more we desire the Word, and crave the Word, and understand the Word, and memorize the Word, how it reacts, and how it works in our hearts and in our lives through, again, the work of the Spirit. 
And so thinking about this journey of obedience, this is what James 1, 19, 25 is all about. So verses 1 through 18 of chapter 1, you're trying to, James is kind of laying out the idea in the Christian life that trials and tribulations that come in the life of a believer and how we kind of work through those, through those and how we handle those. And then he gets to this part. And so now we must answer the question, how do we respond to truth, the truth of God's word? So how do we respond to the truth, the truth of God's word? So one, we receive the word humbly. Look at 19 again. Know this, my beloved brothers, let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger. For the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Therefore, put away all filthiness and rampant wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word, which is able to save your souls. And so how do we use that verse 19? I mean, we can, how do we normally hear that used? Um, be quick to hear, slow to speak, and, and slow to anger. It's usually just kind of in a practical way of just kind of keep your mouth closed and, and listen, right? Do a whole lot more listening than you do talking. So somebody made the statement, God gave us two ears and one mouth, right? That should tell us something, that we should be using these a whole lot more. And we can use it in a practical way, but what James is discussing here about quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger is when we approach God's Word. When we come to his word, he is saying, quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger. So James is basically saying, hurry up and listen. Be quiet, slow to speak, be humble as you approach the word, not coming with your defenses up, which leads to anger and resistance to the word. So how does this kind of this kind of thought, this concept is, is a lot of times in life, we don't go to God's word when we need to go to God's word. We go to God's word when we want to justify something. When we got something that's going on in our life, but we want to try to find some scripture that kind of backs what we're doing or says that what I'm doing is okay. And we sometimes, a lot of times we go to God's word in, in the wrong mindset, in the wrong heart. And James says, what we've got to do is we've got to approach God's word with our mouth closed. Our ears open, ready to hear what the word wants to say to us. Not what we want to say to the word or not what we want to bring to the word or not how we want to change the word or manipulate the word to fit an agenda or fit an argument we're having or try to justify something we may not like in the church. We want to try to find a scripture for that. He says that's not what it's about. It's about coming with a heart that is ready to be quiet and to listen to what God wants to teach us through the word. Because when we approach the word in a wrong way, we approach the word with our own agenda and our own ideas, it creates what? He said, be slow to speak and slow to anger. We don't get what we want out of the word. It doesn't say what we want it to say. And so we get angry. We get frustrated. And look what he says about that. He said, for the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. So don't we often approach God's word talking and not listening? Don't we often come to God's word thinking, here's what I want it to say? And don't we often come to God's word looking to justify ourselves? We are like people in an argument. Anybody ever been in an argument? <laughs> no, nah, ain't none of us been in an argument before, right? Dennis, you ever been in an argument with Miss Sheila? We walk around together. <laughs> <laughs> I just kind of, I looked over and seen him grinning, so I thought this was a good opportunity to pick on y'all. But what happens in an argument? She wins. She wins. She wins, right? How well do we listen in an argument? We're not listening in an argument, right? We're ready to get our word in. We're ready to, we're formulating. We can't even hear because we're formulating our next response, what we're going to say in retaliation. 
And this is a good statement that I found. It says, we loathe to listen and are anxious to argue. We loathe to listen and we are anxious to argue. And I really think sometimes we we got to be careful that we don't approach God and His Word with that type of attitude, coming defensive, coming not seeing what we want to see in the Word. And it causes us to be angry. It causes us to be argumentative. It causes, sometimes it can cause chaos in our life. And so we think about how we approach God's Word at times and we see things that we don't care for. It says we often hear verses like Luke 12, 33 that says, sell your possessions and give to the poor. Or we hear verses like go and make disciples of all nations. Or we hear verses like, you know, go give the reason of the hope that you have that is in Christ Jesus. These commands that we have and we see them and and we were looking for ways to sometimes to get out of it. We're trying to get out of these things. We're trying to get out of these commands. We're trying to get out of these statutes that God has laid out for us. And here's the thing about it is as hard as some of the things are that we're called to do in following Jesus, they're for our benefit. They're for our good. They're for our best. I think sometimes we don't realize it because we know if we follow Christ in the way that the Word has called us to follow Christ, it's going to be what? Hard. We don't like hard. We like to coast. We like things simple. We like things easy. But I promise you, I'll give you as much time as you want. You're not ever going to find a scripture in there where where God promised that. Where he said that this life would be easy if you follow me. What did Jesus say? Take up your cross. cross. Deny yourself. Take up your cross daily and follow me. And so we see this this truth about we're, we're trying to get around God's word all throughout history. Instead of humbling and listening to God's word, his people have resisted. This was the response of God's people to the prophets in the Old Testament. Remember Isaiah 6? When, when and Isaiah gets that glimpse of, of glory, that glimpse of heaven and, and of the throne, and his, after he has repented of, of, his, of himself and, and the, he said the lips of his people, how they speak and how they talk. And what was his statement? Here I am, send me. And it didn't take long for God to tell him, I'm going to send you and you're going to preach. But what? Nobody's going to listen. It's not going to be the place where you think you're going. Hmm. Someplace else. But he said, here's what I need you to do. You're going to preach, and you're going to preach for a long time. And nobody's going to listen. But in that, Isaiah was what? Obedient. And he went. It was hard. If you go study the book of Isaiah, it was hard on Isaiah to go doing what he did. He's, he's proclaiming the, the truth that God had given him about the, the coming destruction and things that were coming, and it was hard for him to go out isolated to preach in the way that he had been called to preach, knowing that nobody was going to listen, knowing that nobody was going to hear what he said, but he did it anyway. And it's the same way for us when we start thinking about This idea of what we've been called to. We have not been called to to sit in this church week after week and just be spectators. That is, find that one for me. Find that text that justifies that. Guess what? It's not fair. We've been called to be on mission every day. Where God has you each and every day It is a, here I am, send me every day of your life. Whether that is at a workplace, whether that, whatever it is, whatever it is that you're doing, that is God's call on your life. And then he talks about, for the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. We talked about that a little bit, but look at that last line. The word anger in the Greek describes a deep internal resentment and rejection in this context of God's Word. This anger, this deep resentment. 
and this not wanting to have anything to do with God's Word. And we live in a society, we live in the South, the Bible Belt, where we think there's just not people around like that, but they're around. Several weeks ago, we had a team that was at uh, the Baldwin County Fair out in Robertsdale. And we had the opportunity to hand out um, outreach bags. The outreach bags had uh, the Jesus Film DVD in it and a QR code to watch it. It had a track and it had a little information about our church. And so we were out, spread out. Some were working at the tent, painting faces, and uh, some of the rest of us were um, giving these bags out. And if you hadn't seen my, if any of you don't know who my little daughter is, Liliana, she's nine years old. She was on a mission that night. She was handing these bags out if they wanted it or not. I mean, it was like, you're, you say no, but you're taking this bag kind of attitude that she had. But in that, we would have people that would stop and say, what's in it? Well, there's a Jesus. Nope. No, thank you. I don't have nothing to do with that. Time after time after time. Just the mention of that one name. I didn't say God. I didn't even say about the Bible. But just the mention of the name of Jesus was no. I don't want to have anything to do with that. And you kind of sense that statement, that internal resentment. They don't really understand, but there was that resentment toward Jesus and, and who they kind of thought that he was, who they had in their mind that he was and this anger that they had. Then he says, put away all this filthiness and rampant wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word, which is able to save your souls. And so this idea of put away or rid yourselves is literally taking off, it's almost taking off a garment. We bring so many, listen to this statement, we bring so many ideas from the world that the word confronts encounters. We bring, you hear that statement? We bring so many ideas from the world that the word confronts encounters. But James tells us to put aside the sinful and selfish ideas of the world and come humbly to the word. The goal is never to get around what the word says. And the question I pose there, why would you want to get around it? Do we really believe that this is God's word? And do we really believe that it's truth? And do we really believe in our hearts that it benefits us more than anything else in this life? So why would we want to get around it? Why would we want to look for another avenue or another agenda to get behind? God's word is good. God is good. He is faithful. Again, his word is for our benefit regardless of how hard it may be, regardless of how hard the call is to follow Jesus, man, it's for our benefit. It is for our benefit. And why would you want to change the word to fit your agenda and your thoughts? How good are, are our agendas most of the time? I know how mine are. I know when I get frustrated and I get aggravated about things. Can you imagine somebody getting frustrated and aggravated in ministry? Huh? Can you imagine being in church? We get frustrated, right? We get frustrated with one another at times. And then all of a sudden, we de develop our own agendas about things and our own ideas and our own concepts about things, about how to handle situations. And God is telling us, just, just humbly approach my word and I'll tell you how to do this. I'll tell you how to handle this. I'll show you how to walk through this. My way is better than your way. It's what he's always telling us in so many different situations. And then James talks about the implanted word. Look at this scripture from, from Jeremiah 30, 31. And it says, Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. Not like the covenant that I made with their fathers on the day when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. My covenant that they broke, though I was their husband, declares the Lord. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them, 
and I will write it on their hearts and I will be their God and they shall be my people. Write it. He says, I'm going to write it on their hearts. And for us as New Testament believers, how did God take that word and, and implant it in us and write it on our hearts? Well, one way is through the Holy Spirit. A second way is us going to the word, us being in the word, us knowing the word, us memorizing the word, us saturating our lives with the word. And that gives us this idea of the implanted word. And then look what Ezekiel says, kind of on this same concept, Ezekiel 36. He says, I will take from you the nations and gather you from all countries and bring you into your own land. I will sprinkle clean water on you and you shall be clean from all your uncleanliness and from your idols. I will cleanse you and I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you. And this kind of the beauty of, of even this Old Testament prophecy that Ezekiel is, is writing to God's people uh, again about warning them, but how this relates to us, how it relates to the cross, how it relates to, to when we come to, to faith in Christ, that he does what? He gives us a new heart. And what comes with that new heart? New desires, right? New desires, new actions. But then he says that I'm going to put a new spirit in you. His spirit, the Holy Spirit that he puts within us. And look at this, and I'll remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you. Again, he mentions that and calls you to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey my rules. Old Testament translating into New Testament and what James is writing. But 27, you better underline it, highlight it, circle it of what God's word was saying even then to us today. He says, I'm going to put my spirit within you and calls you it's important that we understand that and calls you to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey my rules. So what does that mean for us when we think about what James is, is saying and it really in the entire book and, and us as followers of Christ, truly followers of Christ, his spirit comes in and the spirit is going to do what? calls us to be obedient. We're not obedient on our own. Correct? We are just broken, just messed up. There's something in the sinful nature that we inherited from our parents way back in Genesis chapter 3. And so we're automatically, we've been in We've had this, this idea of, of this disobedience DNA that's been passed down to us. But God says, I'm going to change that. I'm going to put my spirit in you. And when I put my spirit in you, it's going to cause you, it's going to cause you, cause you, cause you to do the things that I tell you to do. It's a pretty good word right there we pull out of Ezekiel. Everybody with me? So God has planted his word in us and our hearts find life in this word. Like the blood that flows to our hearts, we need this word. So God has planted his word in us. David Platt wrote, the language here is potent, emphasizing how we are not saved by works, but by receiving the word. And how the word planted in us then moves to action. So that's what a, some people kind of read James and say James and Paul kind of disagree in their theology, but they don't disagree in their theology. Paul lays out faith in Christ as grace, for by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is a gift of God, not of works. And James comes along later, and James, the, the concept is the same. But James is laying it out to this group of dispersed believers 
that have been dispersed because of persecution that you see in, in Acts chapter 8 and Acts chapter 9. And he's writing to these believers because they're, they're dispersed into these, these pagan cities and these pagan towns where there's a lot of temptation, there's a lot of things that are going on. But what he is saying is, he said, we're not saved by doing good works. James is going to say the same thing. He said, but what I'm going to tell you is that when you truly come to Christ, when you're truly in Christ, that what? You're going to be on mission. There's no claiming Christ and sitting and doing nothing. It's just not true. It's, just, it's not a truth. It's not in the Word. That we have been called, we're a sent people. Again, that looks different in each and every one of our lives. But we are called to go. We're called because of what He has already done. What He has already accomplished through the cross and through the resurrection. And we are partakers in that. We've been called by grace to that, to that salvation. And we've received that free gift. Because of that, we're compelled to go. The Spirit causes us to go. That's not my ideas. That's not my concepts. That's not my thoughts. That's God's Word. That's God's Word. So we put, we work to put our faith into action. But we do this by the Word at work in our hearts. We work to put our faith into action, but we do this by the Word that is what? At work in our hearts. Where did that Word come from that is in our hearts? James said that what? God implanted that Word in us. And so when we approach God's Word, we approach it with this attitude of, of being quiet. Y'all know I repeat a lot of stuff of being quiet and having ears to hear where and what God is directing you to go and do. Not bringing your own agenda, not bringing your own ideas, but God, what is it that you would have me to do today? And the more we're in the Word, and in church we talk about this a lot, right? And the scary thing to me, and I'm probably going to mention it again in a little bit, is how many people in, in 26 years of ministry and different positions I've had in different places in Birmingham and, and, and down here, you kind of see the same uh, idea at times that there are people that sit in the church that have so much knowledge about the Bible. And they have such a good understanding about really the concepts of Scripture and who Jesus is, but then you look at your li their life and there's just no fruit being produced. There's no fruit. There's no go. There's no mission. And when you think about that, that's kind of a scary, kind of a scary place to be in or even uh, find yourself in. And so here's a couple questions. Uh, what role should God's Word play in the pursuit of our Christ-likeness? Uh, why do you think so many professing Christians struggle to find time for God's Word? Is it a problem of discipline or desire or both? And these are things I want you to kind of think about as you take these notes home. Don't leave them laying on the table because I'm making a mental note of where everybody is right now. <laughs> if I find your notes laying there, I'll bring them to, to deliver them to your house tomorrow. Um, and then what does it say about our hearts when we have trouble listening instead of expressing our opinions? We have trouble listening. And then number two, we remember the word constantly. And so he says in verse 22, key verse, we'll get back to it in just a little bit, but be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he's like a man who looks intently at his natural face in a mirror. He looks at himself and goes away and at once forgets what he was like. But the one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and perseveres, being no hearer who forgets, but a doer who acts, he will be blessed in his doing. So he's like this man, this person standing before the mirror. 
and looking at himself and looking intently into that mirror and then walks away and immediately forgets what he has just seen and what he has just looked at. And so James is relating that to the Word. So the person who only hears God's Word without doing it has the same sense and stability as a man who looks into a mirror and immediately forgets what he saw. The information he received did not do any good in his life. So he looks intently. And this idea of the mirror, the mirror is what? God's Word. Looking intently into God's Word and hearing what it says and kind of seeing what it says and, and, and maybe even discussing what it says with people around them or in their Bible study group, but yet they walk away and forget immediately what it said. Immediately what it said. So this idea of observing the natural face, the ancient Greek word translated observing, is the idea of careful scrutiny. By application, James had in mind the people who gave a careful scrutiny of God's Word. They may be regarded as Bible experts, but it still doesn't result in doing. We may know a lot about God's Word. We may have a lot of God's Word memorized. We may have taught Sunday school, maybe former pastors. There may be so many things. But if we see God's Word and we're not obedient to it, did we really see God's Word? If we hear God's Word and we're not obedient to it, did we really hear God's Word? It's something we got to wrestle with and that we got to think about. Again, this is not Sean's ideas or his concepts. This is what the Word says. This is what James says. This is what Jesus says in the Sermon on the Mount. This is what John says in 1 John. It's all over Scripture. It's all over the New Testament. This idea of being these doers of the Word and not hearers only, being obedient to the one that has called you. So we've got to be careful not to be just full of knowledge and no understanding of what, what we have. No understanding of the knowledge that we're just we're full of it. We're swelled with knowledge. But yet when it comes to living it out, there's nothing there. So again, I pose the question, what good did it do for you to have heard that word, for you to have understood that word, for you to have processed that word? Because it didn't change what? The heart. It was not implanted like James says. So understanding this power of the Word of God, the preacher is responsible for working hearts and not hinder this power. And I, and I kind of threw this in there because I've seen this quote from Spurgeon, and he said, certain preachers dream that it is their business to paint pretty pictures, but it is not so. Some preachers dream that it is their business to paint pretty pictures. Meaning what? Discernment. This idea of taking God's Word and, and, and kind of sometimes manipulate it a little bit, make it sound a little bit better than, than what it really says. Make it easier. Let's make it easier. Because if we make it easier, then we'll have more people come in. If we really don't talk about the entirety of Scripture, if we just kind of pull things out that sound good and look good, we'll have more people come in. But Spurgeon said, that's not, we can't, we're not called to paint pretty pictures. Look what he says. We are not to design and sketch, but simply to give the reflection of truth. We are to hold up the mirror. We are to hold up the mirror in a moral and spiritual sense and let men see themselves therein. It is not my responsibility. It is not my call to paint some kind of pretty picture of what this says. There's, there's no way. I cannot do that. I'm going to be, Scripture says, I'm going to be held to a higher standard because of this position that I have. And it scares me to death about thinking about how, when I come to this Word and how I handle it and how I put it out there. And as hard as it is, I've got to put it out there for what it says. I've got to put the Word up and let man look at himself. 
in that mirror, in that word. And all I am is the mouthpiece. Then God through his spirit does the work and does the rest. And then he says, we have not even to make the mirror, but only to hold it up. The thoughts of God are not our own thoughts. They are to be set before our hearers' minds, and they discover a man to himself. The word of the Lord is a revealer of secrets. It shows a man his life, his thoughts, his heart, his innermost self. It shows a man is one of the revealer of secrets. It shows a man his life, his thoughts, his heart, and his innermost self. And when we take this mirror and we put it up and we look intently into it and it reveals these things, we don't like it. We don't like what it shows us. We don't like what it's trying to teach us. We don't like the things that it's calling us to change and the things that it's calling us to give up. We just don't like it. And if we don't like it, it goes back to the other text. What? We just get angry about it. We just get angry about it. So a healthy person looks in the mirror to do something, not to just admire the image. Even so, a healthy Christian looks into God's Word to do something about it, not just store up facts that he will not put into use by being a doer of the Word. But he looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues in it. And he says, and James lays that out, that the one that looks into the perfect law of liberty and basically says, if is obedient, then he says what? He'll be blessed in what he does. And this is not a prosperity verse. This is not prosperity. But it's talking about blessings in this life, the spiritual blessings in this life that we receive by being obedient to the gospel. It's not stuff. We find ourselves too often looking for stuff instead of looking for what God wants to give us through being obedient to Him and through His Word. You just go talk to these, this group that just got back from Hazelhurst. They spent three days down there serving and cooking meals and doing storm cleanup. Go talk to them about the joy that God put in their hearts by going and doing the work of the gospel. That's the blessing that James is talking about. That's the blessing we get out of following his word. Then Adam Clark points out that the ancient Greek word translated continues and has a sense, take time to see and examine the state of his soul, the grace of his God, the extent of his duty, the height of the promised glory. The metaphor is taken from those females who spend too much time at their glass in order that they may decorate themselves to the greatest advantage and not leave one hair or the smallest ornament out of its place. Some of you ladies spend too much time in front of the mirror. I think I spend more time than my wife does in front of the mirror. She has got a system like I've never seen. And I mean, you could, you could create a, a layout of her minute by minute and, and it'd be on it. And I mean, she can get, quicker ready, get ready quicker than I can. And this comes out beautiful, right? Make sure y'all tell her I said that. She's over <laughs> practicing choir. Make sure she gets that message from me. But this, this staring into this glass, and he talks about the perfect law of liberty. This is a beautiful way to describe the Word of God and the new covenant. It says the whole doctrine of Scripture, especially the gospel called the law in Romans 3, both as it is a rule and by reason of the power it hath over our heart and the law of liberty because it shows the way to the best liberty, freedom from sin, the bondage of ceremonial law, the rigor of moral, and from the wrath of God. And this commentator is talking about this law of liberty because this statement right here, a lot of people have taken and run with it and twist it and turn this law of liberty in, into an idea of living lifestyles the way they want to live them, and it's just not what he's talking about. He's talking about Jesus had fulfilled the law, and now we, we live in this, this liberty in Christ, 
and we have this freedom from sin and we have freedom from the bondage of ceremonial law and we have freedom from all these different things but more importantly because of what he's done we have freedom from the wrath of God that is going to come upon so many people y'all with me? And this command to not forget God's word reminds us of the history of God's people in Deuteronomy 6. This is one of my favorites, especially in the Old Testament. It says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children. And you shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and, and when you rise. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and, you shall, and they shall be as frontless between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorpost of your house and on your gates. I'm going to go back thousands of years, and Moses is, is laying this out and writing this out in, in Deuteronomy. And it's so important for us to understand it here today, thousands of years later, when he's talking about God's word and his statutes and his commands, that what are we to do with them? Talk about them when? Constantly. These things, this implanted word that's been put on our hearts, he says, you're to talk about it constantly. You're to teach it to your children. You put it on the doorposts of your homes. You're to put it everywhere. And why is Moses stressing that so strongly? Because he knows that the more that we have the word in our hearts and the more we look at the word and the more we think about the word and the way that we dwell on it, that what? It's good. Life is so much better. Still hard, but it's better. And that word, again, is implanted in our hearts, and it shows us how to live and what to do. And then in Deuteronomy 8, just a couple of chapters later, he says, And you shall eat and be full, and you shall bless the Lord your God for the good land that he has given you. Take care lest you forget the Lord your God by not keeping his commandments. In his rules and his statutes, which I command you today, lest when you have eaten and are full and have built good houses and live in them, and when your herds and flocks multiply and your silver and gold is multiplied and all that you have is multiplied, then your heart will be lifted up and you forget the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt and out of the house of slavery, who led you through the great and terrifying wilderness with its fiery serpents and scorpions and thirsty ground where there was no water, who brought you water out of the flinty rock, who fed you in the wilderness with manna that your fathers did not know, that he might humble you to test you to do you good in the end. And he says, Beware lest you say in, my, in your heart, My power and my might of hand had gotten me this wealth. You shall remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you the power to get wealth, that he may confirm his covenant that he swore to your fathers as it is this day. And so he's, his commandment's talking about that. And he says that I'm giving you this land that I promised you, and it's all this wealth and everything that you're going to need. And he, he says, but you're going to get in the land, and here's what you're going to do. You're going to build big houses, and you're going to have all this stuff, and you're going to be consumed by what I have blessed you with, and then you're going to do what? Forget about me. It's this stuff that I've delivered you out of so much, I've brought you out of bondage, and I'm giving you the promised land and everything that's in it. He said, but you're going to get in there, and you're going to be consumed, and you're going to forget about me. And he said, when you forget about me, you forget about my commands. You forget about me, you forget about my decrees. When you forget about me, you forget about my statutes. And then when you forget about me, you forget how to live. You forget how to live in that idea of, of liberty in Christ. We go back to the Old Testament, it's no different then than it is now. We're the same knuckleheads as they were back then. The same knuckleheads that have a tendency to forget about God because we get consumed with so many other things that are around us. And we forget about Him. And we forget about how He's brought us out of bondage. But you may say, well, He didn't bring me out. I, you know, I went in Egypt. Here you are. You were in Egypt. 
You were in bondage. You were in slavery to sin. And God brought you out. He saved you and He brought you out. It's real easy for us to forget. And that's what He's warning about. Get that Word in you. Let that Word be just ever before you that you don't forget. Don't forget God's Word. Let it lodge in your heart and lay in your mind. Have it always before you. So how do we do this? Just simple. Read it. Memorize it. Put it in your heart. Read it. Memorize it. Study it. I think it's good that you know, we have these reading plans for a year and that you can try to read through the Bible for, for a year, which is, which is great. But I think we need to, to have this, this place to where we approach God's Word, again, quiet, ready to listen, but we're just taking little bites at a time and saying, God, what is it you want to teach me through this? It may just be one scripture a day. Maybe one scripture a week that God needs to use to speak through you. I mean, speak, speak to you through Himself, through His Word. And just marinate on it and think on it and pray that Scripture. And let that Word be implanted in your heart. So do we value Scripture? Do we value Scripture more than our TV shows or our favorite sports teams? Oh my goodness, do we want to get into that? Do we want to get into that idolatry? Because that's simply what it is. And do we tend to commit to memory those things we value most? If God's word was of value, if we say it's of value, then we tend to commit it to what? Memory. We tend to know it. We tend to be ready to, to present it. I heard David Platt say one time, do you have enough of God's Word in your heart that if somebody came in one day and took all of your Bibles away, took all your access to the Bible on your phone, the Bible online, took it away, you had no more access to it, do you have enough of God's Word in your heart to survive, to make it day to day? You wouldn't have this to turn to. You wouldn't have that phone to scroll through and get to your verse of the day. But is there enough implanted and hidden in your heart? <coughs> Something to think about. So if all we do in corporate, in corporate worship is listen, then we're like the fool that James speaks of in James in verses 23 and 24. We listen and leave, and by lunch it is gone. Why do you come to worship? Why are you here on Sundays? Are you here to hear the word that comes from the Lord through the man that is going to be speaking it? You're here just to check the box off? You're here to check the box off. Just, I mean, not, you know. I will stay at the house. Because you come for the wrong purpose and for the wrong reason. We should come to God's word and approach it kind of in the same way, ready to... One, for us to be together. Isn't it beautiful to be together each and every week to come in and, and fellowship and see? You know, I've always got people that I'm looking for each and every week to come through the doors. Probably everybody's like that. You've got certain people you're looking for every week. When we come together and we fellowship and in corporate worship and it's time to hear God's Word, praise through song and through the preaching of the Word, and then we go to Bible study. Just this beautiful picture of what the church is supposed to look like. And what the church is supposed to do is to encourage us and to spur us along and get us prepared to go do what we got to do on Monday. And to go do what we got to do on Tuesday. And go do what we got to do on Wednesday. And then we roll back in tonight and we get to hear the word again and get to be together and share a meal together to, go, to get us ready to go out and do what we got to do Thursday. And what we got to do Friday and what we got to do Saturday. That, that's the, the beauty of it. And if we come in and we just kind of sit and we listen and we walk out and God's Word has never penetrated our hearts, been implanted in our hearts or spoken to us, what good was it? And granted, we come in with so many distractions and we come in with so much junk at times. But that's where we've got to figure out what steps we need to take in order to, to come in ready to hear from Him. Ready to hear what He's got to say to us. 
And not only what he's got to say to us, but the beauty of the body of Christ is God uses us sometimes to speak truth into each other's lives. That's the beauty of the body, the body of Christ. We hear God's word, but we also, there are times of accountability that we speak truth into to our brother's life or to our sister's life that they need to hear. That's, that's the church. That's the beauty of the church. And then the third one, this is the one my guys didn't get to. So we obey the word, word wholeheartedly. James 1.22, but be doers of the word and not hearers only. That last part, deceiving yourselves. This is the verse, this is the theme verse of the entire book of James. You have not listened to the word if you have not obeyed the word. The bottom line is that the word evokes and if there is no action from the word, then clearly there has been no acceptance of the word. Our life when the Holy Spirit, again, I'm repeating, I want to hammer these things in. But when the Spirit of God comes in, it truly comes into our hearts and to our lives, redeems us, then He pushes us to go. And we can kick against it and we can quench the spirit and we can fight at times, but he's going to draw us back to where we need to be. He's going to get our attention. But then look at that statement. I've got it underlined and highlighted. Those who've accepted Jesus obey Jesus. To think any differently is to live in deception. That's what James said. Be doers of the word, not hearers only. What's the last part? Deceiving yourselves. And what James is saying, what Jesus says on the Sermon on the Mount, what John says in 1 John, that if you hear the word, and that's all you do is hear the word, there's no doing, and you've got this sense that everything is okay, everything is good, you're deceived. You are being, you are deceived. Again, that's not my idea. This is Scripture. These are things that sometimes we don't want to hear. Again, it's hard. But guess who's not going to stand in front of God and for, for not telling y'all what y'all need to hear? Not this guy. You may not like it, but it's kind of like my daughter said, like a hill, you will get over it, right? <laughs> I hear that little nine-year-old tell me that. Some quite on a regular basis. I'm like, where do you get these little catchy phrases from at nine years old? Look at 1 John 2, 1 through 6. My, my little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. What good news is that, right? Is that not beautiful? He says, I'm writing to you so that you don't sin, but that if you do sin, we got what? We got an advocate. Jesus, the righteous. That has already taken care of that. He is the propitiation for our sins, and not only for ours, but also for the sins of the world. And by this, we know that we have come to him if we keep his commandments. And by this, we know that we have come to him if we keep his commandments. You want me to do that a third time? And by this, we know him if we keep his commandments. Whoever says, I know him, but does not keep his commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word, in him truly the love of God is perfected. By this, we may know that we are in him. Whoever says he abides in him ought to walk in the same way in which he walked. Who? Jesus. Now, don't get some kind of crazy idea that I'm teaching some kind of perfection in here because you know I'm not. What we're talking about in here is the fact of that we've been called to be obedient to God's commands. We've been called to be obedient. Dave Platt says, James says, you are blind to your true spiritual condition if you claim to have heard, received, and accepted this word, yet you fail to act on it. 
you're deceiving yourself or you think you're right with God because you listen to the word, maybe even because you listened intently. But according to James, you are wrong. So here's some of James's, James's words sound eerily familiar to Jesus' words in the Sermon on the Mount. I believe this is chapter 7, verse 21 says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, do we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do mighty works in your name? And then will I declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness, you workers of iniquity. Now, for, for me, and, and my guys have heard me say this, that's some of the most sober and scariest scripture there are in, in God's word. And then he says, he goes on in the same chapter, everyone who hears these words of mine and does them is like the wise man who built his house on the rock and the rain fell, the floods came and the winds blew and beat on that house, but it did not fall because it had been founded on the rock. It had been founded on Jesus. It had been founded on the word. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain fell. And the floods came, and the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell. And what? Great was the fall. James and Jesus had something really go, and it's kind of this parallel thoughts here. And then Tony Meredith says, if your spiritual life is built on merely listening to the words of Jesus and not obeying them, then one day your life will eternally and ultimately end in destruction. And that's hard words, but Jesus just laid that out. And danger is that you're going to think you're okay all the way up until that day. There's so many people that's going to think everything is good. I check the boxes every week. I go to church. I pray. When things come up and I'll, you know, I read my verse of the day off my phone and, you know, that's check those boxes and man I'm, I'm good I'm doing good but then they pull the mirror out and they begin to look in it intently and then they begin to realize that what not doing so good not doing so good because again it's not about what even though he's talking about us doing, it's not about what we do. It's about what he's already done. And because of what he's already done, again, compels us to go and to do. So I'm convinced that countless people within church listen to the word week after week, but it's not planted in their hearts. And it's evident because they're not acting on it. Sure, they act on things that agree with their lifestyle or they act when it's convenient to obey. But when the word confronts, challenges, convicts, or tries to change them, they put it aside and forget it, never putting it into action. Be careful if this describes your life because this is not the Christian life at all. It's not the Christian life. The word confronts, the word cuts, the word is hard, and that's its job. It's the responsibility of, of the word that God has given us is to teach us how to live. Again, everything that you want to do in life is in the word. Directions and instructions for it. But at the same time is when we choose our own path and choose our own things and our own agendas, it, it corrects us. It shows us clearly that our way is no good. That our way is just going to get us, we're going to fall in a ditch. And God is like, look at my word, study my word, know my word, because it's good for you. It's beneficial to you. And the scary statement of the church today is people just say, I just need to be willing to obey God's word. I'm a, I just need to be willing to obey God's word particularly when it calls me to do something radical in my life or in my culture. Don't be willing to obey the word. Obey the word. Don't be willing to help the poor. Help the poor. Don't be willing to share the gospel. Share the gospel. Don't be willing to live in purity. Live in purity. Why? Because God's word tells us to. 
And if you listen and you don't do anything, did you really listen? We're getting there. Y'all fixing to be done with me. James, not me. You better be done with James for, well, maybe if I can get this thing there. So Danny Aiken wrote, for some followers of Christ, there'll be an area of outright disobedience or an area of delayed obedience. It's an area of life where they have been putting off God's word. Is there an area in your life that you know that you're being disobedient in? That God has specifically called you or directed you or showed you in his word something in your life that you need to be doing or that you need to stop doing. And that you're just ignoring it. You're just being this, this, this delayed obedience. They know what God's word says, but they are not putting it into practice. The word is saying, turn from gossip, turn from pornography, turn from, be reconciled to your spouse. And maybe they are ignoring it or it doesn't fit with what they want. Or perhaps the word is saying something that goes against the grand culture. In the end, we must obey God's word regardless of the circumstances or the consequences. This is one mark of true faith as the Bible defines it. As the Bible defines it. Not what I define not what Pastor Eric defines, not what any of us in leadership defines, but what God's Word defines. This is this book, Back to Jerusalem, is what it's called, written by three Chinese pastors in the underground church. And I read part of this, and it was just amazing to read. It wrote about the difference between believers and disciples. Listen to this. He says, true disciples are usually people that few understand. They are viewed as potentially unstable fanatics. That's what I'd love to be known as, right? Some of you are thinking I'm unstable right now after sitting for this hour and listening. Often the same governments, listen to this, often the same governments that tolerate the existence of mere believers will stop at no ends to completely eradicate any disciple within their borders. Do you understand the implications of what this, these pastors are saying? That somebody that says in, in wherever it is, in, in China, wherever, kind of related to the same thing, when somebody says, yeah, I know what God's Word says, oh yeah, I go to church, I do all those good things. Oh yeah, I'm a believer. But they're not a disciple. Guess what they do with those believers? Just let them keep on doing what they're doing. Just let them keep on doing what they're doing. But these people that are being obedient to the gospel and truly following Jesus in the way that he's called, look what he says. They'll do whatever it takes to eradicate them, to get rid of them. Why? Because they're speaking the truth. And people are hearing the truth. And people are coming to Christ because of them speaking the truth. And they went gone. But then believers over there, they're good. They're good. They know the truth, they just don't talk about it. They know the truth, they just don't live it. Just, just let them be. Let them keep doing what they're doing. They're just fine. Just fine. Did you get that? These pastors saying the government time really does not care about people who are listening to the word, but the government wants to imprison or kill those who are doing the word. So list some areas in your life where you've said you're willing to obey, but you're not actively obeying, and how will you move forward in these areas? And then how is James's call for obedient different from an attempt to earn a right standing before God? That is works righteousness. The gospel, I want to be clear. And everything that we've talked about in James, the gospel is not a works-based salvation. And that is not what James is talking about. The gospel is, is completed in Christ. Again, it is by faith, by, by grace through faith. Notice what Paul says, For by grace you've been saved through faith, that not of yourselves, it is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Because if it was for works, we'd do what? We'd brag about it. We'll talk to everybody about, look what I've done. But he says that we are in Christ. We are created. We're in Christ.
to be his workmanship. Because of grace and because of our faith in Christ, and because of what he has done, now we go. Now we go do good works. Now we go and serve. Now we go and share the gospel. Now we go love that neighbor that is unlovely. It's not because we're going to earn favor with God. Our favor is already wrapped up in Jesus before God. But we go because of what he has already done. Amen? All right. That's all I got. That's enough. <laughs> That's enough. So look at that. Live it out. What areas in your life do you need to seek out God and His wisdom regarding areas of disobedience? I know these things we don't like to talk about, but these things we got to, to be able to, to look at, to look into that mirror, to look into the Word and intently uh, ask God to reveal these things to us. Then memorize. Learn James 1, 22 to 25. This will be a powerful reminder of your need to stop making excuses and repent. All right. I'm going to lead us in a word of prayer. Y'all make sure you remember Mission Sunday coming up this week. Um, we got, we'll have a lot of our local ministries that'll be out in the commons set up and um, talking about things they do locally. Um, we'll have a church planner from Salt Lake City, from Valley Light Church that we started partnering with this year. He'll be preaching Sunday morning. Then we'll have the dinner Sunday night, which the church is invited to. Um, um, he'll be speaking again that night. Then we got a young guy. I think he is maybe 30 years old, and him and his wife are missionaries in South Asia. Um, so they'll be here as well as speaking. You'll hear about some things that, that we accomplished this year uh, on mission trips and kind of get a little vision of what we're going to be doing next year. So come be a part of it Sunday night. If you don't want to sign up online, I've got a, uh, some sign-up sheets out here by the little cart with the TV on it with a QR code. And if you're just the type that don't want to do the online, just go out there and put your name so we can have a little number. And, and so we'll be um, ready food-wise uh, for Sunday night. It's going, to be a, it's going to be a good time together. All right, let's pray. So God, we're just thankful for this day. And Father, I thank you for letting me be with my people, Father, my brothers and sisters in Christ. And Father, as hard as your work can be, Father, we're thankful that, God, you have given it to us uh, to remind us who you are and what you expect. Because, God, we're so often, I, I so often forget you. I get so distracted by so many things and I get full of pride in myself. I just get in the way of so many things and I forget about you, Lord. And I ask that you forgive me for that. And I thank you that your word shows us and teaches us what we need to know. And, Father, I pray as, as hard as these words were tonight, Father, I know that your word spoken will not go forth void, that it's going to work, and it's going to continue to work in the hearts of your people. And so, God, give us a, a good rest of our week. Father, help us to, to step into obedience, to step into these opportunities that we have um, each and every day. Sometimes we just miss because we're so distracted. But help us to have open eyes and help us to see um, things through, through your gospel and through your lens, Father. And so, again, give us a good week. Help us be salt and light. God, we just love you, thank you, and praise you. In Christ's name I pray. Amen.